We've waited some time for the Skynetic Bison to get here, and now that it is, the question is, was it worth the wait? Did it meet our lofty expectations? And the answer to that is very much so. Today on Model Aviator, we'll tell you all about it and show you what this thing can do. What's up everybody, you're watching Model Aviator. My name's Adam and this is the Skynetic Bison XT from Motion RC. In today's Model Aviator video, we're gonna share some things we came across in the build that we think might help you if you're building one. And then we're gonna show you our very first day at the field with the airplane. We'll show you our maiden flight and then we'll show you a bunch of clips from successive flights as we began to really explore this airplane's very wide performance envelope. The more we got it dialed in, the more used to it we got, the better it got. Uh, we really think you'll like the flying footage and there's some backcountry landing type stuff there you'll get a kick out of if we test this very robust gear. Uh, it's pretty awesome. So anyway, then we'll end up back here in the shop where we will give you our setup and some final thoughts. So we are honored that you're here. Thanks so much for stopping by. We hope you enjoy this. Check it out. All right, so we'll go through a few things that we came across in the build. The first of which is the tires. This was my first experience gluing a tire to a rim. I'm not an RC car guy, so that's not something I've ever really done. Uh, I talked to an RC car buddy of mine after the fact. Wish I'd talked to him beforehand. Um, I was impatient. We we're trying to get this video out as soon as possible, so I didn't want to wait for tire glue to come in. All tire glue is is essentially CA, but it's a CA that is a compound that when dry is more flexible. Uh, it's also kind of between medium and thin, so you can get it on there, but it seals up better than regular CA. I use regular CA. It's not as clean of a job, and I had some leaks that I had to go back and add CA to fix. Uh, but that said, once I got it done, it did work. Um, it's not, like I said, as clean of a job as it would be if you actually used tire glue like you're supposed to, uh, but it did work. We put this airplane and these tires through their paces over the course of a day, uh, and you know the seal never failed. So CA, regular CA that you have in your shop will work, uh, but you'll be best served to actually use tire glue. Second thing is, while we're on the subject of tires, the tail wheel. Uh, easy to put on, not a big deal. Springs are easy to get on, but the springs are way too weak. Um, I had to put pretty much a ridiculous amount of control throw on the rudder just to get the tail wheel to move enough to kind of turn in a taxi. I never could really get them to work very, very well. And to get the throw, the way that the rudder attaches, it's got two little hinge pins that go into preset holes on the airplane and what holds it in place is one screw at the bottom. When you put that screw in the bottom, there is material on the bottom of the rudder that runs into material on the bottom of the fuselage at very little deflection. You could get more if that screw wasn't there because it could move side to side. But if it's held in place by the screw, you're going to run material into material and not have enough deflection to get that tail wheel to turn very much. So I had to take a Dremel tool and relieve some of the material from the rudder before I put it on there and attach the screw so that I could get full throw. And when I say a lot of throw, I've got as much throw as I could get in there. It's almost touching the sides of the elevator. And even with that, um, it turns Okie dokie to the right, nowhere near as tight as it needs to, and won't hardly turn to the left at all. So I think stronger springs would solve that whole problem and you wouldn't need um, anywhere near as much throw as I did. So the third thing that I came across is with these metal brackets. Uh, there are six metal brackets on the airplane. There are the two on the fuselage for the top of the shocks, and then there are four, two on each wing where the struts attach to the wing. For some reason, mine had burrs in the holes that your bolt is supposed to go through, so much so that I couldn't get the bolt in there. Uh, I used a round file to kind of deburr that so that I would still have a really tight fit with the bolt. I didn't want the bolt to have any play. You can drill it out, but it'd be very easy if you drill it out, which would be the quicker way to do it, to make the hole a little too big and have a bolt that will slightly jiggle around in the hole. 
and I didn't want that, so I used a round file to remedy that. Again, that may just be a problem that my particular airplane had. You may not even come across that, but if you do, I'd use a round file. Next thing we came across was with the lights. There is a light controller uh, coming off of the ESC. Uh, I mistakenly thought that that might be a regulator of the voltage going into the LEDs because I've actually blown LEDs before putting too much voltage, but I think that was a two cell LiPo and that was my problem. Um, that is actually just a controller that controls the nav lights on either end of the wing and makes the white lights blink, um, kind of like a strobe. Um, you'll have other lights, uh, like the light on the tail and uh, the light underneath here, that will have to plug in somewhere else and you'll need some Y harnesses for that. Uh, airplane doesn't come with Y harnesses. I had a couple laying around. You can probably get away with just one Y harness if you have a much bigger receiver than I used. I'm only using a six channel receiver, so I needed two. Uh, but just to let you know, you don't have to worry about where you plug them in or putting too much voltage to any of the LEDs. The BEC in the ESC is only gonna put out about five and a half volts, and that's not enough to hurt any of these lights. And finally, the last thing is with the slats. Per the instructions, if you hook the slats up to the flap servo, what will happen is when the flaps come down, that's going to actuate the slaps to go in what I call the extended position. This would be extended, close to the wing would be retracted. Uh, in the retracted position, that is where the slat works most efficiently. Well, that's actually where it works, period. That's where it's intended to be to keep laminar flow going over the wing and help you continue to make lift at a higher angle of attack. Uh, you can hook them up and you can get some high alpha without the flaps down, but if you're able to have the slats in the retracted position and get the flaps down, you can really get it high alpha and really get it slow. You'll see some cool stuff in the flying footage of that. Um, so I didn't hook them up. I've got them pretty much permanently attached not permanently. There's a little quick connect that you can push. That's what is hooked to the flap servo. I just have some foam on either side of that to hold the slats in the position I want to keep them in. Uh, so I didn't hook that up. If you want to get the slowest high alpha you can get, that's the way to do it. So I have to say in conclusion that for a foamy, this is a pretty difficult build. Um, you know, it, it saying foamy and build in the same sentence doesn't really sound right because I've actually built airplane kits before. I've assembled ARFs. That's a lot more involved than any foamy, but for a foamy, this is a difficult build. Um, if you have, you know, 8, 10, or 12 of these things under your belt and a, a full shop of tools, it'll be a whole lot easier for you. Just use your patience. If you haven't built a lot of foamies um, and you don't have a lot of tools at your disposal, I'm not saying necessarily shy away from the airplane, but I would say you definitely need to be patient and don't get frustrated. Um, I will say this, it is well worth the finished product when you get done. Uh, the performance you get out of this airplane is well worth going to any trouble you have to go to to get it built and get it built right. Uh, and with that, we're going to go to the flying footage and uh, show you the payoff of building this baby. Check this out. So we're headed out for our maiden flight, and you can see, even though I've got a crazy amount of throw in that rudder, the thing will hardly turn to the left, so I give up and go to the right. Turns much better that way. It's actually pretty inconsistent, just depending on what kind of ground you're on. All that rudder is going to bite me right off the bat on the takeoff. That big wing dip, that was a rudder correction. I was trying to correct for P-factor and what seemed like a little bit of rudder to me did a lot.
Right about now, I'm thinking about how much rudder it takes to turn an airplane with slats. I had forgotten about that. Airplanes in this configuration need a lot of rudder anyway, but with slats, they need it even more. You're going to notice a little edited part right there. That is because our lens blurred with this low light. That happens one other time in the maiden flight, but we're still on the same flight. At this point, I'm just making passes back and forth, trying to get everything trimmed. Took a good bit of up elevator on this first flight. I had our battery pretty much forward for the maiden flight. And I'm trying to find the right combination of aileron and rudder to get it where I want it. Here I've climbed up and I'm going to try a stall test. And right there I'm at full back elevator and it finally broke a little bit but fell straight forward. Those slats really work. I'm going to try one the other way now and finally got it to break. Doing a stall test now with full flaps. And finally got it to break, but pretty docile. The plane took a lot of up trim with the battery in the forward position. Felt nose heavy, but even nose heavy with full flaps. As you can see, it really will get slow. I noticed in this first flight that the airplane just inspires confidence. When you get it slow, it likes being there even with the weight what I felt like was more forward really liking what I was feeling at this point and thinking about putting the battery back a little bit seeing what that did And this will be our maiden landing. Not bad. Look at that gear soak that up. So 
so now we're moving into footage throughout the morning and the day. I'd gotten the hang of the rudder and the takeoffs at that point, thankfully. With the battery back, I'm really liking the way the airplane feels. Uh, at this point, I didn't know where the balance point would measure, but I knew I liked what I was feeling. The airplane really inspires confidence. In higher alpha, those slats really work. Most of this footage, uh, we show a little bit of everything. We show some sport aerobatics just to show that the airplane will do inverted flight, knife edges, loops, things like that. But most of it, things like this, slips, a lot of uh, stall type takeoffs and landings. Our mission for this airplane is going to be to fly it as a scale stall plane. So. That's mostly what you see. You'll notice here that even inverted with the slats, airplane's really controllable. Takes a bit of down elevator to hold it here. I wouldn't go as far as to say that it's happy there, but it will absolutely do it, and there's plenty of elevator left over. Here I'm about to make my one and only hover attempt with it just to see if it will. You'll notice you can hear the prop cavitating. That's a sure sign at full throttle when you hear that, that it's in a tail slide and there's not quite enough power to maintain it. You'll notice with the crazy rudder throw I have set, there's more than enough for a knife edge. I think it would do it with less rudder, but you'd have to go faster. This straight on view is a really good view of that gear doing its job. It's a reasonably smooth stall landing, but you can see that suspension working.
Here's some footage of us landing on the drive coming up to the field. It's a gravel road. This looks kind of backcountry-ish, if you will. Really enjoyed doing it. And yes, I got permission from the club president to land behind the line. There was just myself, Heidi, which is my wife and our camera girl, and one other person who was spotting for us. Can't say enough about just how much I love this airplane. It flies exactly the way that I hoped it would, and it will just get better as I get more time on it. Couldn't help but think about landing on a gravel bar in a real shock cub and then parking it for a picnic. Oh, 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 everybody here, this thing is awesome, and you need one. You can, you can plow fill with it. You can carry beer in it. You can hook a gun to the struts. You can take your sister for a date. It only costs $19.95 at Walmart. About the only thing it needs is a green John Deere paint job. What? Man, you don't let me do nothing. Bye. Bubba, I don't know about that guy. What I do know is that pretty much everything he said other than this thing is awesome and you need one was complete crap. Um, yeah, I don't even know what else to say. Like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for joining us and uh, we will hopefully see you next week without Bubba. As our setup scrolls in for you, the one thing I wanted to point out was regarding balance. Our balance point was 77 millimeters from the front of the slats with the plane right side up, and that measures out to be about 25% of the core to the wing, or forward of where you typically have the balance, which is 30% the core to the wing on an airplane in this configuration. The online manual called for it at 56 millimeters. That seems awfully far forward. Uh, that would be somewhere around 20 percent, 15 or 20 percent the quarter of the wing. That seems really, really nose heavy to me. You saw the flying footage at 77 millimeters. The airplane flies wonderfully. So we just thought we'd point that out. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe.